God, I'm saying my prayers. I'm reading, I'm even reading my Bible before I go to bed, my little good news Bible. Uh, I'm, I'm saying my prayers. I'm going to church. I'm trying to be a good guy. What's your problem, God? Welcome to another episode of God is Not a Theory. Today, I've got my very good friend, Ed Lochran, with me. He's a pastor in the Chicago area, and um, I've known Ed now for, I'm not sure, but at least a 10-year period, maybe longer. Uh, we were introduced by mutual friends. Ed has a fascinating background, one that I'm sure you're going to enjoy. We don't have a lot of guests like him because there aren't many people like him. Um, I'll give you a quick overview. Um, Ed is a Christian lawyer, and no, that's not a contradiction of terms. And he was a practicing lawyer for quite a while before he became a pastor. He's also known um, by those who know him and beyond as a prophet. He has a, a translocal ministry beyond the local church. And um, in addition to all of that, he's been raised from the dead three times. That's right. You heard that correctly. So um, I think you're going to enjoy today's conversation. Ed, it's a great pleasure to have you on our show. It's great to be with you, Ken, and I'm so happy just to hang out with you and talk about things and actually contend for the kingdom together, man. It's always good to see you and talk to you. Yeah, we're we're fellow laborers in the kingdom. Um, you can notice that Ed's uh, kind of dude it up. He's uh, he's at a conference this weekend and he stepped out of his um, of his activities there in order to be on the podcast. And you can tell that I have a different background. I'm filming um, a new round of classes for Orbis School of Ministry. Uh, this upcoming one will be on how to heal people who are caught in sexual brokenness of any kind. And so uh, both of us have kind of unusual backdrops today, but um, we're going to make it work. And so let's get things rolling. Ed, I always ask people to uh, give us a little bit of background just to give people context. Uh, tell us about your own background and how you came to faith, but share a little bit about your own upbringing as well. Sure. Well, my mother and father were Roman Catholics, but they weren't just Christmas and Easter Catholics. They really believed they were involved in, you know, I think, uh, right of Christian initiation and like the discipleship thing to become Catholic. And regardless of whatever happened with my life, they had real faith. It wasn't hypothetical. I, I credit my mom with helping me learn how to pray. And so believing Catholic, um, highly, uh, I think I came from a very loving family. I, I feel extraordinarily blessed that I felt unconditional love until God started leading me in some new spiritual directions, deeper things of the kingdom that rocked the boat a little bit. But that was all ultimately resolved in time. But that was my background, Catholic school. Um, so going to college, I brought my little good news Bible with me. I had a, a, you know, I had some weird spiritual encounters even while I was in high school. And, and I had a picture of Jesus I'd take with me and be on my wall in my dorm room. And so that was my background uh, from just from a young, a young boy. I remember feeling the presence at midnight mass and my family sang, you know, there's, people who never sing, but my family would sing. My dad would sing loudly in at church, whatever the song was or the, you know, the psalm refrain in the, in the Catholic mass is like, they, they were all in, they were all in with their Catholicism. So this makes you um, unusual because we haven't had many guests with that background. Uh, it's a strange thing. It's, it's almost like a badge of honor in the charismatic world to say that you came from this extremely broken background, you, you know, you were a drunk and ne'er do well, used drugs, slept around, um, you know, went crazy for a period. And somehow when you crash landed, you found Jesus, which I mean, certainly he rescues people out of that. But you're basically describing um, a much more uh, predictable, sane, <laughs> intact family, middle class existence, and marked by Roman Catholicism. Um, I don't have any issues with this, but I know for some of our listeners, they they struggle with it. Wait a minute, a Catholic who's a believer? Um, tell us how you came to faith in a Catholic context. What is What did that look like? Well, this goes to the supernatural aspect. And, and certainly, although my parents 
were very strong in their faith and I knew where they came from. It didn't mean that college life was perfect and sinless. So that would that would be untrue if I were to say that. It wasn't a terrible thing, um, a terrible, exp I'm being a pretty good guy. So uh, I like in my last year of law school, I'm like, God, I'm saying my prayers. I'm reading, I'm even reading my Bible before I go to bed, my little good news Bible. Uh, I'm, I'm saying my prayers. I'm going to church. I'm trying to be a good guy. What's your problem, God? That I remember saying that as a prayer, you know, I'm like I'm doing everything I'm supposed to. And yet, you know, the power of sin and the power of culture, the context of the environment around you. I remember someone said, you have, I had a picture of wall on Jesus on my wall. It was by this Lutheran guy. It's a famous picture. And she said, are you some Jesus freak? And I'm like, uh, I, I don't think I'm a Jesus freak. I just like Jesus. But it was like, for some, I began to see the secular. I've been pretty isolated within the Catholic community, within the parishes, within all those, that environment. And then a lot of Catholics go to college and they go crazy because they have had no restraint. And uh, so, so anyway, in my second year in law school, I had a dream. And in that dream, an angel came and pointed out all the sin in my life. I remember an inventory and they had, I love to play pool. I'm a little competitive, just a little. And, uh, and so they had, I'd play for beers at the bar with pool, but at that import night, I remember the last thing I remember is the angel holding its hands up. And then I woke up out of the dream, like, Oh my goodness. And, but it was a picture of women modeling plants. I'd wanted at the bar on import night, there was nothing pornographic. It was just totally suggestive. And I remember taking that off the wall and I figured it was worth 50 bucks. So I figured I'm, I'll sell it to somebody and maybe God doesn't want me to do it, but it was really that postmodern thinking, being a liberal arts background, being involved in law school, being involved in academics. So even though it was the eighties, it was, I was highly saturated in that type of postmodern thinking. And then I came into that last year of law school. I, I I heard a guy on the radio and he said to me, he said, I'm not to me, but he did say it to me. He said, I found out that God doesn't answer this question. What's wrong with you, God? But he loves to answer the question, hey, God, what's wrong with me? <laughs> and I'm like, I found that to be true almost universally, that he <laughs> loves to answer the question. So like, is there something wrong with me? And, uh, and so... I, I realized no one had told me that God wanted my whole life. I had been brought up to do the good things. I didn't understand he wanted my whole life. And so, although I had prayed, watched enough Protestant TV to pray prayers and do all the things, I God was drawing me. My mom and people were praying for me. I know that that was going on. I didn't get that God wanted my whole life. And so in my third year of law school, my grandfather was an attorney and involved in politics and stuff. My dad was an attorney. He went back to law school when I was, I think, uh, in eighth grade. And uh, I had that. I said, I don't care what my family thinks. I don't care what my friends think. I don't care what my professors think. You know, I have to get my life right with you. God, send me to Africa. I said, send, that was the prayer. The guy, God wanted my whole life. And, and when I said that, nothing happened right there. But I was on my knees in my bedroom by myself. But the next day, I felt like I walk, woke up and I had, um, I was in seventh grade again. I was pretty naive. And, you know, I grew up in the country, outside of the city. We moved back in after my dad went back to law school. But I felt like I used to carry silica sand and be a tough guy. I felt like 200 pounds of bags of silica sand were lifted off my shoulders. And I'm like, wow, you know, I'm... I'm, I'm I, here. I am. I'm, I'm, there's a freedom. There's something changed. My wife, not my wife, my, my mother then invited me to a life in the spirit seminar with sister Linda Kuntz. It was at St. John's church in Joliet, Illinois. And uh, I went there and I got filled with the Holy spirit, had some self deliverance. And it's kind of an awesome story. Cause I said, after I got filled with the Holy spirit, I had a couple thoughts come to me. And the first one was, you know, this is, you know, this is gibberish. And I'm like, 
ah, that's baloney. I rebuked that. Would be contemporary. I'm like, ah. And then the next one said, uh, you're you're just making this up. And I'm like, I am not making up this tongues thing. I rebuked that. And the last one said, this is from the devil. And I'm like, well, this is certainly spiritual. You know, what is this? And I said, I, and then like, I rebuked that in the name of Jesus. And then when I did that, I felt things lift off of me. And it felt as if my heart went through the gymnasium ceiling. I felt so light. So in the same way, it's as if the sin was relieved, there was still spiritual weight or damage or or forces that God wanted to set me free from. And from there, that was a powerful thing. I then said, God, not realizing God had just spoken to me. I said, God, I hear all these Protestants say, God told me this and God told me that. I said, say something to this Catholic boy. And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to be quiet. And the first thought comes, I love you. Mm. And, um, and it was probably like five minutes and I'm like, just soaking it in and 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 just like I just like oh I love you I love you and I'm like the God of the universe just said He loved me because I knew it was the thought came clear it wasn't my thought and then I'm thinking God is answering questions should I ask again and being from a Catholic or even a traditional church background a lot of people carry a little unworthiness you know I'm like and so I said God I've been reading my Bible and I said if those Hebrews if Abraham and could bargain over the number of righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah before you would destroy the city. I said, I have precedence to argue that I can ask another question. Cause if God, if Abraham bargained with God, I can ask that too. And he said, uh, I, I said, God ask, speak to me. And he said, your sins are forgiven. Mm. And as much as I received the love, I needed to hear that. I need especially to as a Catholic, huh? Because Catholics are so focused on sin. Yes, yes. And sin in the law, you know, and 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 so I just like it was like so freeing. And then I'm thinking, God's answering questions. Should I I went for a third one? <laughs> and I'm like, that's my personality. I'm gonna do that anyway. And uh it's who he's who he made me to be. And I said, God asked me, and he said, Hey Eddie man, that's all you need to know right now. <laughs> and so it was like isn't that hilarious? Hey, Eddie, man. And that's not what my ball players, all the basketball players, Eddie, man. Hey, Eddie, man, pass me the ball. Hey, Eddie. And it was like, that was like contemporary slang among my peers for me. Yeah. And that's how God spoke to me. I'm like, God, you speak in 1980 slang. You know, it was like, it was well, more importantly, he called you, as we'd say, by name, but maybe yeah. more colloquially, he called you by your nickname. He did. He did. He did. And uh, so, I came back from that and I led my best friend to Christ. I then led my girlfriend, who's now my wife, to Christ and about 20 to 25 people. And I didn't know much. I'd been around InterVarsity enough to know there's four spiritual laws and how to lead people to Christ. But, you know, they didn't like me. I was this crazy Catholic Holy Spirit knucklehead back when dispensationalism and cessationist stuff was rampant. And so I was... I remember somebody coming up to me. This is worth telling you, Ken. You know, God doesn't speak and do that today. And I'm like, the lawyer brain kicked in. I'm like, so what you're telling me is the devil sent me a dream to point out all my sin in my life so that I would turn to Jesus. Is that what you're telling me? And they're like, oh, you know, and they started sputtering and they never messed with me again. But it was just crazy. I, I don't know how my life experience, how, how could I not stand up or bear reproach for Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father? How can I not do that? I I feel like I'm on a short lease. I've had so many good things. It's almost like I love God, but there's also, I really love God. I want to, I want to love him and obey him and make him famous. But there's also this, like, I, I don't want to grieve his heart. How could I, how can I deny him? Like, it's as if my wife, oh, uh, she screwed up or she messed up or something. I said, uh, you're not my wife today. I'm like, how could I, how could I disown God? I, I don't know. <laughs> like, and there's fear there, but there's like, oh God, I want to honor you. But it's just like, it would, it's almost like my heart would be broken to disown him or mm -hmm. to, and not like you don't do it and have to repent because we all do, but it's just like, oh, I don't know how that would happen.
Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, so a rather dramatic uh, start or transition out of a traditional Catholic background into one that is uh, filled with heart faith. Yeah. Be an interesting way to put it. Yeah. All right. So you, you lead your girlfriend to the Lord. You ultimately marry her and you uh, don't just charge into ministry. You embark upon a career in the law. Now I know some of the background because we've yeah. talked about it, but our listeners don't. So tell us some of the uh, multi-layered, multi-textured background that your family has uh, in the law, because it runs deep in your family. And I guess you therefore come by it naturally, but there's some fascinating stories and coming from Chicago, which is, um, what do we want to say about Chicago? It has a bit of a checkered history from a legal standpoint. Uh, you've been able to see, and your family's been able to see, uh, observe, participate in some, I would say, rather fascinating um, accounts. So there are many, but you know, pick one or two just to give our listeners a sense of what your early professional life looked like. Well, when I joined the law firm, my grandpa had retired. He practiced law until he was 89, uh, won his last case. Uh, in trial. He was he was the trial attorney of the year for several years in the 50s. He was a state representative for, I think, 12 years and in a political party chairman for the county for a long time. So my, my family was well entrenched in the city. And I assume this would have been the Democratic Party, right? That would be true. Yeah. My my grandfather came out of World War One. He was set. He was deployed over there to be in a tank crew corps or crew. But the war ended before he had to see action. He came back, and back in those days, you didn't have to go to law school if you would apprentice with somebody. But since he was Irish and Catholic in our area at the time, no one would apprentice him. So his father had passed away. So he had two big brothers. One's a fireman, and one was worked at the local railroad. The railroad guy gave him a pass to go to DePaul University, help pay for that. His fireman helped him pay for books and stuff. And he went to law school, and that changed the trajectory of our, our lives. And DePaul's a Jesuit school, so there was kind of that Jesuit help everybody, social justice type of thing in my family. Although I hate to say social justice, it means so many crazy things. But I, I probably prefer kingdom justice. So, like, there were some race riots in Chicago in the 20s, and, and, and my grandfather, without any, this was absolutely foolish, you know, join the NAACP. The family tradition is that, that he was the first person in the state or the first person in the county who was a white guy to join that. And so my family was involved in helping all types of people. They didn't care, you know, because he grew up hungry. My, when my, my grandfather's father died. My great-grandfather passed away. My, the story in my family is, is, you know, you could get an orange. My grandpa got an orange for Christmas. And that's how dirt poor they were. And so my life, I, I, I rest, I, I rejoice in the legacy that was given to me. So when we came in and I started practicing law, my grandpa as being one of the top attorneys in the whole state. Uh, there were a bunch of lawyers in their 60s at that time. When you're in your 60s, you've got lots of experience. And I don't care how brilliant a 25-year-old kid is, you're going to spank them pretty good. And these guys started coming after me. Ken, they were coming after me like, your grandpa did this to me. And I'm like, holy cow. I'm like, I was like, what the heck? I realized that within three or four year period, I probably had 15 years of legal experience because they were coming after me. They, you know, like you had to get good. You had to be better. And, and so at the time I thought it was unfair, but in retrospect, I'm like, oh no, that was a gift from God. Adversity was a gift there. And so when I joined the law firm, our family law caseload quadrupled. It quadrupled. Wow. And, and I say I learned how to pastor. I learned how to deal with boundaries. And I learned how to try to keep God's uh, center. I, I learned to pray from that, Ken. I, I don't know what else to say. Trying to keep my heart soft. I would pray an hour before I'd go to work. And then I'd do prayer walks in the evening if, if I wasn't in a, a basketball league on that night. But it was like just keeping my heart soft was the battle. So I honor anybody living in the trenches. If you're in business, 
if you're a fireman, a policeman, if you're a ditch digger, if you're a judge, if you're a lawyer, I'm like, when you're living in the place where you see some of the worst brutal things and you're still trying to bring light, I, I honor them because so often the church wants to isolate from bad things and not actually engage yeah. in the in the broken things. So that would be my my background. I, I know I probably gave a little more than just my lawyer background, but I by the time I after a few years, I was doing family law. I had seven local churches who would send their clients, send their the large churches, well, nice established churches, sending me any family law work because uh, although I told God I hate divorce more than he does because I kind of felt that way, I, I the Lord said to me, Ed, you know, what? what's the worst thing about this business? I said, it just takes a little bitterness, either from a client or a lawyer. And the only people who win are the lawyers. So the fee turns into a monstrous thing. He says, are you doing that, Ed? I said, no, Lord, I don't do that. I, I can't stand before you. And and for just adding bitterness between two broken people, just a little bitterness, salt in the wounds. How could you let that woman or that guy get away with this? That's, um, you know, they're treating you so poorly. Just you a lot of lawyers stoked that to their own financial gain. And I, I don't know the hearts of people. I can't know for sure that's why they did it, but I had a good inkling that some of them did it that way, <laughs> you know, and, and it was just heartbreaking. And he says, do you do that? And I said, no, Lord. And, and I wouldn't take a, I wouldn't prosecute a case with those with within the Christian community without pastoral approval. In other words, they've walked through the process. I'm not, because I didn't want to carry the spiritual consequences of that. I, right. I didn't. I and but I defended anybody, and and so that's what I did. And so that that was kind of a the niche that I had in the in that world. But I've done murder trials. I've done wrongful death cases. I've done. I did real estate. I I did. I did a lot of stuff. But probably fifty percent of of my practice was family law. Twenty percent was criminal law, and probably another. Uh, 15 to 20 percent was real estate at the time and i did most all that stuff wow so you made a comment a few minutes ago about keeping your heart soft and how hard that is when you're on the firing line in any uh you know real job is what i'm gonna say um how did you do that what i mean what was what was your process for maintaining your suppleness before the lord for me i would pray in the spirit an hour a day before i went every day because if i didn't do that can i wanted to strangle people and i went back to a 60th birthday party for a peer of mine uh who was in the law and i saw all these lawyers i hadn't seen in a long time and, and they looked really old ken and i had a judge say to me yeah it's it's not the number of years it's the number of miles and when you are seeing horrific things on a, of culture and society, it wears on your soul. So for me, my initial reaction is I wanted to, uh, I, I called it the two-handed throttling muffin, you know, where you want to just go, what's wrong with you? I'm like, I knew that that wasn't going to work. I also, uh, I've, I've been that way as a pastor, frankly. You're like, I know it doesn't work, but there's sometimes you just want to go, you know, you knucklehead. There we go. I'll stop there. Otherwise, I could go off and, and totally go off on that subject again. <laughs> because you're like, oh, so I knew my heart. I knew I had to keep my heart tender before God. Above all, above all else. I know it's hard. I know I'm feeling sorrow. I know God is forming character in me. I know all this stuff. And 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 yet to not say that's enough. I think participating with the process of sanctification or, you know, or what God was doing on the inside. I think just saying yes to him and letting him do it. And we were in the vineyard at those times, at that time. And in those years we were doing inner healing. We first, the power of God was there. There was healing. There was touch. There's like, I, I, I remember they said at the church, they said, if you ever want to feel, to feel like you're not doing well as a worship leader, Ed and Molly are on the second row right over there. Just looked at them because Ed and Molly were always like, oh. I still cry when I worship because I don't know anything. The greatest treasure of my life, I think, is 
that I'm still in the game and I've kept my heart soft. And I, somebody asked me, what is the most important thing to do? If you could tell people one person, one thing, I said, keep your heart soft before God. Because if you don't, you're open to deception and to pain and disappointment. And I could keep talking. So how did I do it? I just cultivated the presence of God. I did prayer walks. For me, the discipline, the last thing I would say on that is I would not do TV or anything in the evening until I had done the prayer walk. And and what's funny is my wife, you know, I've been married now um, 35 years, and she'll say, she says this to me, I think you need to, need to go on a prayer walk when I get a little grumpy. And she says, and, and then she says, you're looking kind of sexy in those grumpy pants. She's <laughs> like, you just we learned to to banter with comedy, you know, like because you know we can confront each other a lot better through a little humor and wit than just you're grumpy and a jerk. Go get out of my house. That doesn't work as well as hey, you're kind of sexy with those grumpy pants on. And I'm like, do, do I need to go for a prayer walk? I think you need to go for a prayer walk. But it's like. <laughs> You know how you come to the end and there's people, I, I heard something uh, a professional, there's actually a diagnosis of compassion fatigue. I think what I fought during the whole time would be the diagnosis of compassion fatigue. And so I would do for me the supernatural exchange. God, here's my heart. Lord, I want to strangle this person. Lord, I want to go. I have six seconds of love. I want to go literally. This is how I felt. I want to physically go over to this older lawyer that grandpa brought, you know, gave him some comeuppance along the way. I want to physically break him in half and beat the tar out of him. I was like, because he was just being so unreasonable. And I'm like, I can't give in to you. I don't give, care. I got a client on the line. This is not about me. This is about representing my client's interest. I'm not going to bail on this client from out of my own, out of the pressure. And so, yeah. Yeah, I got six seconds of love, God. If you don't show up at seven, I don't know what I'm gonna do. But that was that was God took me to that place again and again. But I think there was a reliance that had to be developed in God to I needed a supernatural. I I guess the last story I'd say about the law office, or I, I, maybe it's not the last story, but I remember my secretary, she you know, I have to say an administrative assistant, but we could say secretary in the 80s or 90s. And I trained her. I brought her in. She did everything. And she came in one day and she looked at me and she was like, you are so different with your clients. I'm like, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? And she's like, you're just different. And I was like, so I serve them. She's like, yeah, but, but no, she's like, I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, you love your clients. Cause I would tolerate. I had, I had patience. I was actually pastoring these people. I didn't know it. Right. I was pastoring them in the worst place of their lives, which was a divorce. And I led people to Christ. They've been filled with the Holy Spirit. It was I had far more evangelistic opportunities as a lawyer than even as a pastor. So I have to not even tell people I'm a pastor because, but because it, it limits that. But to say to have a non-Christian say you love your clients was a really that I I want, I'm like wow I must be doing something, and all it was was trying to keep my heart soft and treat and love people, care for people. You know, it's interesting. I have a friend who um, is, I would say, essentially retired at this point, although I don't know, he's a busy enough guy. I don't think he'll ever be fully retired, but I met him through the vineyard and he's, um, he's had a very fruitful uh, ministry, uh, sometimes as a minister, uh, you know, professional minister, and other times as a businessman. Um, and he, at one time, I remember him saying, and it was kind of the theme that he would say for a number of years, is that he wanted to be um, a pastor to the people who had no pastor. Mm. You know, Jesus said that these people are like sheep without a shepherd. And I, I think one of the things that many people miss is that perhaps the opportunities are fewer and far between or further between when you're in a secular role or a, you know, a non-ministerial role. Maybe that's true. Um, it probably is more a function of how spirit led you are and what kind of ministry God's given you. Uh, but <clears throat> but at the same time, there's there's a real opportunity when you're out there in the world um, to interface with people who would never darken the doors of the church and would probably never even think to call upon a pastor for 
counsel or help when they were in difficulty. Um, and it's obviously easier when you're in your own legal practice and you don't have a, an HR department that's overseeing what you do and certainly doesn't want any religious conversation going on. So I know it can vary based on job description and location. But what you just said was that, you know, maybe you had more opportunity to interact with people in this way when you were a lawyer than once you made the transition to pastor. And uh, and that was somehow part of the satisfaction of the job for you. At least that's what I think I heard. You oh, say. oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I If I'm on the streets or wherever, I, I love there's two things that make my heart the fullest is one is seeing people powerfully touched or rocked by God. And the other thing is seeing God lead people, to, leading people, seeing God move on people by the power of the Holy Spirit, not spirit on the streets. You know, being a little prophetic, you there's a vicarious overflow or backsplash of seeing somebody get saved that just melts your heart again. So I'm I'm that's those are my two addictions probably in my head too. It's just that I, and I, I don't know how to say it other than I have to do those things sooner or later or I'm going to explode. I have to see that stuff. If I don't get to see that stuff, I I feel like I'm not living up to what God's made me to be in I don't that's as clear of an answer as I can give on that, but I really think in the secular environment People aren't expecting things. And just to show kindness or wisdom or love, the heart of God is meant to help us minister. Everybody gets to play. Everybody's called to play. Everybody's called to be in the game. And I think if you don't recognize that, you miss out on the fullness of joy because you're afraid of money or different things. One example, of you talk about the HR stuff and, and, and we're bound by ethics. And I would say to clients, I said, you know what? We've gone through the law stuff. Do you mind if I take my lawyer hat off? And just put on my regular person hat. Could I? Would you give me permission to do that? So this is not a lawyer conversation. This is this is just a person. The person. Can I? Do I have permission? And I'm not even billing by the hour while I while. I and I'm not charging you. I'm not billing you for the prayer time or whatever. I, yeah. you know, like I remember talking about what is love. I think love is patient and is kind. You're saying he loves you, but he's abusing you. You're saying she loves you, but she's betraying you you know what you know what i mean and 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 i said and then you're so there were some hard conversations but i think most people don't have most people i don't know have had a heart to heart conversation with a semi healthy person it's easy in our world to say that big jerk pile on and cause the vision it's harder to try to express love but if you'll do that in a secular environment, it's the opportunities are extraordinary. So I started praying for the my I didn't know of any Christians in my county where we practiced. I started praying before I left to do pastoring. There were seven lawyers who were Christians who had prayed together, who I was I'd helped talk to and and were able to stand up in their faith. But it started with me and praying and praying with the bailiff. And and uh, so I look at that as a great thing that we can bring influence wherever we are. That's a really powerful statement. We've had other people on this podcast who have expressed, you know, for their own context, their own life, what this looked like. Um, but it's kind of interesting how, you know, in the sovereign dealings of God, um, he drew you into the law where you're dealing with people with um, marriage problems as one of your, primary buckets you said it was about 50 percent of your practice in many ways you were getting um training that a pastor who went to seminary might not have gotten mm -hmm. in terms of how do we deal with marriage conflict how do we deal with couples who are not living according to the teachings of scripture on what makes marriage successful and you know without all the trappings of the church you were bringing churchly wisdom to bear uh, to people who needed it desperately. Did you find that you were able to avert any divorces that were underway? Yeah. So if they came in and they're, you know, do you have a faith background? I would always, I would draw a pie. I'll, so I'll start off. And I'd say, here's a pie chart. We're going to cut off 20% and say all that's left is 80%. So I, I learned to 
um, help, uh, you know, lead in the expectations. I said, because we're going to have utilities, we're going to have new payments, house payments, and there's repeated bills. You're going to double your bills there. So now if I get you 60%, which would be a great settlement, you're still at 48% of all the extra money that's left of what would be there if you had lived together. Have you thought about that? Have you talked to anybody? I would always ask somebody prosecuting, wanting the, a divorce. I don't want to just, I wanted it to be something that needed to be done. I didn't want to just take a retainer and they changed their mind in two days. And, you know, I want to say, have you really thought through this? Because, and I'd explain the process. It could be two years. It could be five years if it's contested. It, you know, uh, it's not an easy process. And, and so, I, I did that. And I'd say, do you have any spiritual background? You know, what's your, well, I go to this church, the pastor sent me here, or I did not go to this church. So if the pastor sent me and I'm like, well, what's he say? He said to come talk to you. I'm like, okay, that means they've worked through it. They are, they, that it's irreconcilable. But if someone came in, I'm in, and I didn't even know them, even if they weren't a Christian or a person of faith, I would challenge them on that to try to protect that. Because I, I think that, um, people may get divorced, but then have the same marriage five times by marrying the same abusive husband or the same um, controlling wife or whatever, you know, whatever it is. And, and, and so I didn't have any, I had, I did that almost, I did it with every client and it was, I think <clears throat> ethically for me to help them understand what they're getting into was important. I, I think the analogy I think of is, is student debt. There's all the student debt out there today. And I think it's because, oh, just get student debt. It's going to be okay. And then they're paying for 30 years. No one, they don't have a financial basis to understand what they're entering into. Go to junior college, do something, you know, don't end up multiple six figures in debt. And, and I, I would do the same thing with the divorce law. <clears throat> I would challenge the people, have you considered all these options? And and that was ethical for me. You know, to, to do that well, you have to set aside the profit principle. Um, obviously, you still need to make money as a lawyer, but uh, you give some counsel, that you're not billing for that time. But even more than that, um, if you are able to save a marriage, all of the legal fees that go with taking a divorce to its conclusion, all of those are forfeit. Um, and yet I'm sure you found that because you were actually seeking the kingdom first, doing good to all men and women as you have opportunity, and especially those of the household of faith. And of course, I am quoting scripture when I say that. Yeah. But you probably found that the Lord blessed and multiplied your practice beyond what it would have been had you simply billed for those hours that would have been part of the divorce that you, you know, got to got to short circuit. So I would come back to keeping my heart soft. And I agree with everything you said. I, I'm going to elaborate. But for me, when I'm having somebody go through a divorce, I want them to have clean hands. But for me, I wanted to have clean hands before God. I, I didn't want to do something that would stop blessing because the 90% or, or whatever blessed goes so much further than the 100%. And if I'm faithful with his people, with the hearts of people, God, I think God rejoiced over that. So when I finally did go into pastoring, uh, I... I I was making, I was making six figures in the eighties as even in my twenties because of this sort of stuff. And, um, I was killing it. I was killing it. <laughs> I thought money was easy to make. You know, it was like, it's like making money is easy, you know? And yet God was leading me to do more stuff too. So I, I think I answered the question. I, I really agree. You, how do you, how do you, I think I had to learn the, about the fear of losing a client. What I'm not going to make money. I'm going to miss out on this. And that's poverty. And it's a fear of loss as yeah. opposed to this is about kingdom. And God wants to bless me more than I could bless myself. And I really believe that. I think his heart is to bless, bless us abundantly in all things. So we can give away abundantly and generously for any need that comes up. So that's a nice paraphrase of Second Corinthians nine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you eventually, uh, I guess, are so busy pastoring as a lawyer, <laughs> uh, 
somehow you feel the call of God and you end up becoming a pastor and you leave the profession. I mean, you're practicing now again, but for a period of time, you were no longer doing that. You were just a minister of the gospel. How did that happen? How, how did you get pulled out of the law and into the ministry? I was at a worship service and God told me to start a small group. So I'm worshiping. You need to start a small group. I talked to my pastor. He said, go ahead and do that. Find seven people to commit for 10 weeks and you got it. And I got that the first seven people, everything happened. Three weeks into the small group, I realized they wanted me to take care of them. And I'm like, crap, I'm going to have to say it. Oh, crap. I'm church planning. I'm I'm pastoring. I'm not a pastor. You know, <laughs> oh, and, and like, you take care of us. And I'm like, well, the pastor of the group, the key to the whole thing is Molly, my wife. She is, you know, she's the pastor. She's the pastor of my soul. But I was an evangelist. And I'm a prophetic dude. I'm a start businesses, do things. But I'm like, how stupid. I'm like, you look back and you're like, you are so stupid, Ed. Couldn't you see that? I'm like, maybe it was holy blinders to stop me from seeing that. And so I did that. We had 25 people coming within a few months. The uh, leader of the church said, hey, we're going to plan a church with you guys. I said, something's got to happen here. We can't keep driving an hour and 15 minutes one way to church. Nobody wanted to do it with us, even though God was showing up in great power and doing amazing things. And, and so they sent someone else down and they... Uh, after a period of several years, they stepped out of the ministry. I said, everybody's free to go. And I restarted, really had to make the choice in 90, end of 93 to say, do I want to do this or do I want to not do this? And that's when I said, okay, I'll, God, I'll do this. I got three conditions. I said, I don't, I want, uh, I want to be part of culture transforming revival. I said, I don't want just a neat church. I don't want a big church. I want something that is transformative. I said, the next thing is that I want, don't want my family to be ruined. I want them to love you. I want them to love us. I don't want them to get ruined by ministry. And the last one I said, Lord, in anywhere but Joliet, which was where I was from, because <laughs> they already thought I was crazy. These lawyers thought I was crazy. You're crazy. What do you mean? You're making this money. You're killing it. And you're going to quit that to do pastoring. It, there was just reproach. There was a story, Ken, that I went to a tent and I was rolling on the ground. And that's how God got a hold of me. There was like crazy stuff. Never, never happened. But you're like, you're like, I'm like, I'll go anywhere, anywhere but Joliet. And then the Lord said, if you can bloom in Nazareth, you can bloom anywhere. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that was I didn't make that the vision statement for the Joliet Vineyard. I did not I did not. I was like, hey, if you can bloom in Nazareth, you can bloom anywhere. And you're like, oh God. You know, so so anyway, I, I said, I said, okay, Lord, I'll do it. And we started all over with seven people in our living room and it grew into the church. And um, and so for me, there came a time where I had several years there was enough income just to support me, but I couldn't get out of the trial cases. I had I had cases set for trial, ongoing, ongoing, ongoing. And um and I had to be ready every month for those trials. And then I when that finally happened, I was free, I think it was like 98 to not have two jobs, and I was burned out. I, I didn't realize how tired I was from full-time lawyer and pastor until six months in and I was like, man, I'm exhausted. And uh, I was just tired, but I got replenished. It was good. And, and I chose not to step away from the law because the law I knew was litigation. It was family law. It wasn't a practice that I could control on my own and have my own schedule. The judges determined it, you know? And, and so uh, by that time I'd been through the vineyard church planning module, uh, I'd read all the books and I'm a reader. I love to read. I love to learn. And, um, and that's how I got back into it. And it was during renewal time in the vineyard context. And we saw all kinds of crazy stuff happen and we still do, but it's, uh, that's how I got involved in it. And I, I realized in the law, people can hire you and they want you just to vindicate them or beat somebody up. And I said, most people in the church don't do that they want to get better 
And that was a significant difference. I still practice law throughout all those years. I do real estate by referral. That's how I got to travel the world. It, it, the, the church couldn't afford to send me all over the world. It was my own stream of income and going to other nations and, and God opened all kinds of doors to do that. And I, I loved it. I love the nations. I love, there's like a whole other gear in my life. There's a gear internationally and there's a gear on the streets that, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't, I can't even put words to. You know, it's interesting. A lot of times people think of being in the ministry as pastoring, um, i.e. a job in a church. You know, maybe you're the senior leader of the congregation, i.e. the CEO. Yeah. Uh, if it's a multi-staff church, maybe they don't have that senior most role, but they lead a department or a division of the church. Um, but a lot of times ministry is boiled down to pastor. Um, and what you're describing when you talk about, you know, going to the nation, you're still caring for people. So in a sense, that never goes away. But at the same time, the context in which you operate and the way you do what you do can shift rather dramatically. And so when you're in the nations or you're on the street, uh, you might be functioning prophetically, you might be functioning evangelistically, or um, it's kind of a loaded term these days. I know you know that um, apostolically. Yeah. And I think sometimes when people are functioning in those ways, it's almost viewed with suspicion. Uh, and yet the scripture is clear. It speaks of these fivefold ministries, as they're called, <laughs> out of Ephesians 4.11. And so what you're telling me is, uh, you know, they use the term gender fluid, your ministry fluid on some level. I, I think there are some people have one or two gifts of expertise, but some of us have a, a, a broader, a diverse gift mix. And I think that helps us. It may be part of apostolic or prophetic. I don't, you know, and let's just call me the hardcore is entrepreneurial. I I inadvertently planted a church and then I intentionally did it. I inadvertently started a business here. I, I've inadvertently started stuff that has been blessed and flourished. And and some would call that an apostolic thing. And I, I embrace that as a not as a title, as a as an outfunctioning of who I am. And I think what I'm hearing from you is there's people who are in the pastor or teacher lane who can't, don't see life the way people in the itinerant and travel and other thing lanes do. They don't, they don't see it the way you do. And, and I think that's, that's to the detriment of the whole church. And it's easy to be misunderstood. I know that if you want to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, call me, I'm ready. Let's get some swords. Let's go after it. You want somebody to hug you and kiss you in your boo-boos and your woundedness? call my wife. She's the pastor. <laughs> she's the, she's got the pastoral gifting. And I'm like, so both are very loving. I, I, you know, if you talk to somebody, you ready to go through the valley of the shadow of death, Ken? Ken, are you ready? Yes, Ken is ready. You know, that's, that's what we're here. Let's go after this. This is, there's something demonic here. Let's, let's go pound this thing. Let's do a little butt kick in prayer. And so that gives that I get energy. I'm talking, I'm feeling energy. Like I'm not doing new age energy. I'm feeling empowered. I'm feeling excited that I want to go after and do that. And I see you talk to somebody else. I'm like, I'll hug him and I'll kiss him, <laughs> you know, and I'll, I'll give him a holy kiss. But you know, like, there's, I'm not, I'm not trying to diminish pastoring because you can't get to some issues unless people know they're loved. And my wife is pastoral and an amazing person bring healing for people. Uh, so, but I, I just see that, I love people. I think we're all called to love people the way we're wired. And if we're not affirmed, Ken, I think we need to be affirmed. You know, if my dad just said, yeah, you're okay. Yeah, it's okay. No, my dad loved me. He affirmed me. He said, you go for it, son. I remember asking him, dad, how did I get so type A? I have to win. I'm like, I want to compete. I think I wanted to be a lawyer because I'm going to get to try cases and compete the rest of my life. Yay, hallelujah. You know, I get to have battle again and again. And he, I said, did something happen to me? And he said, son, you just came out of the womb that way. <laughs> you know, I'm like, but that was liberating as opposed to somebody tormenting me and poking me with a stick. 
from four feet away, you know, like just trying to make me mean. And that's where I really love the diversity of gifts. And, and I, I have to say that I could not be and do where I, what I, uh, what I do without the corresponding gift for me of my wife or people in my church who have those other gifts that compliment me and I compliment them. I I'm glad that she can pastor with an expectation of power because I'm going to talk about power and I can't stop talking about the power of God. I, I, I need the presence of God. I need him to move supernaturally. And so I look at those labels and, and I, um, I just want to bless and rejoice over people and I want to delight over them. I want to delight over pastors and I want to delight over apostles and evangelists and teachers and, you know, and, and, and I want to, and prophets, I want to, I want to rejoice over all those people. I, I think that's the father's heart, Ken. That's the heart of the father Yeah, that we would delight over them. And when you're not affirmed, there's a doubt. If there's not a blessing, the, you know, the old Testament blessing, I bless you. And I, you know, May the Lord be with you. May his face shine upon you. I mean, but I mean, even the personal blessings of a father. I don't know anything that's probably more. That's an overstatement. I, I'm going to try to filter my words, but here's the emotional side. I don't know anything more impacting yeah. over people's lives than yeah. speaking the heart of the father and blessing and rejoicing over who they are. And and I, if I, there was a third thing that fills my heart, Besides the power in the streets, you know, it would be that. Just seeing the deep affection of God beginning to rest on somebody because they have the ability to receive it because I am okay. It is okay to be this way. It's okay to be an entrepreneur. It's okay to want to work with the law. It's okay to love evangelism. It's okay, you know, I'll stop there. I'm kicking into teaching gear, so I'll stop, Ken. No, you're, you're sharing your heart is what you're doing. And I think it's so important because, because so many people have found that whatever is in them, uh, and, you know, your dad said you just came out of the womb that way. It's just this <laughs> you've always been. There's so many people who are told that who they are, what they are, what they were, what their shape is. Yeah. Uh, and I don't mean in shape, like physically yeah. fit. You know, are you a square? Are you a pentagon? Are you a rectangle? What are you? Um, but whatever your shape is, so many people have been told that's not okay. That's not God's way. That's not good enough. And um, I think you just put it so beautifully when you said the affection of God, uh, because that is what parents do. They they delight over, I mean, every parent knows my kids, none of them is the same as the others. They might have some similarities and certainly they're all raised in the same home. So they, they have a hopefully common upbringing, but, <clears throat> uh, but child one is not the same as child two. And is that the same as child three or four? And if you have a fifth or six, it is not the same. Um, but you delight in all of your children and yeah. each in his or her unique capabilities and gifts. Yeah. And, and love languages too. How, yeah. how you love them. You, you love them. This You want to love them lavishly, all of them. But you have to love them differently. You know, one loves gifts, one loves quality time, one, you know, one one loves physical touch. And uh, you know, you're like, that's good words of affirmation. You, you just have to you have to find those pathways into their heart. I think that's the heart of the father. I think that's what I, you know, I I I can't um overstate how I felt really loved by my father. Yeah. And fishing and quality time and so. It's something that is amazing. With that being said, if you had a bad dad or a good dad, when you encounter Father God, the significance is still two miles higher. You know, bad dad, great dad, yeah, Father God. You know, it's like it's infinitely above it, and and that's that's transformational to get that kind of have the affirmation of the of God and the Father's heart and to know. How, how to walk forward you you walk you walk differently in life you're you are your story is redeemed your purposes are restored you become empowered and um 
I don't want to say a forceful, I don't know if forceful is the right word, but you have for you forcefully enter the future. You I guess you lean forward and you're forcefully leaning forward in faith. Like, I'm going after this, man. Yeah. I'm gonna run through the finish line. I'm going after this. And I think the past it it we need that to overcome the passivity of our age. You know, Jesus said <clears throat> from the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven is forcefully advancing. And then there's a couple ways to translate the next little piece of that. But one of them is, and forceful men and women lay hold of it. Um, so what you are actually describing is um, with those facets of the kingdom of God, uh, you actually have to, have, you've got to go after it. You've got to have some gumption. You can't be passive and expect it just to fall on your head and say, oh, okay, the kingdom's arrived. You, you actually have to perceive that it's out there and pursue it. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Well, so let me ask you a question here. Um, you're, you're still practicing law I am. Uh, and you're still pastoring. Um, you just showed us a side of yourself that's very fatherly, uh, very engaged with the heartthrob of God. Some people would say that it's incompatible to, you know, be in something as combative and aggressive as the law uh, and to represent Jesus and to be loving. Um, do you still win legal cases? I, no, I'm not in a litigious place because I could not schedule my life and pastor if I was in, in adversarial litigious things. I do do some probate work, but that's routine process type of stuff. So I, I do not do that, but I, I think, let me give you an example. I remember praying. I'm in the middle of my room and I see a vision and I, of some kids out on the street. And and then this vision, it wasn't, it wasn't real. It was just a vision. I saw three or four kids beating the tar out of one kid bullying. Maybe it's four or five kids, actually it's four or five kids beating them up. And the Lord said, Ed, what would you do with that? I said, I know what I do there because I live right near high school. I'd grab my little league baseball bat in the garage. I'd walk outside and I'd say, you leave this kid alone. I've already called the police and I'm ready to defend him and defend me. If the five of you little hooligans want to do what you want to do. And, and, and that was my attitude. And that's how I was brought up sort of. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. I was brought up that way. And, uh, but up to that point, the Lord said, I can't cross examine any of my parishioners. And he said, but you can deal with bullies. There are some people who are so criminally minded, they only understand force. Litigation is, is a war, a polite warfare where rather than pointing guns at each other, we point legal guns at each other where there are consequences and pain. And with criminal people, with wickedness and evil, there's no other way. The only other way is to have the king or the local mafia boss run it. And this is way better than the king or the mafia boss run in the neighborhood. And and I, so I had no problem litigating and going hard. I had to learn, I, I knew I couldn't lie. Uh, I can be an advocate. And so for me, that was one of the first things, even as a lawyer, because everybody lied. They embellished. You know, I'm going to, oh, my case is worth $2 million. So split the difference and give me a million dollars or something like that. I'm like, mm -hmm. I, I, I actually, be, because I did, wouldn't lie. I put all the things together. I had to fill my proverbial revolver with as many bullets as I can. Trials are pointing, spinning the chambers and pointing it at the opponent. I tried to do that. I learned, people learned that although I didn't ask for outrageous things, I asked for what I was fearing. I, I'm asking for this. I think I can get this. And here I got the facts to back it up. I'm not just talking. You know what I mean? Yep. And when you got that reputation, that you're going to back up what you say and your word is gold and I may not win, but the I'm going to go hard after you. It changed the whole dynamic. It actually led to the ability to settle more cases than having to litigate it because I prepared every case as a trial case. Mm -hmm. I, I was I had to be excellent and diligent. So I, I think I don't, how do you do a policing? Can police do things wrong? Yeah. Can lawyers do things wrong? Can doctors uh, can if you're a colonel in the military, can you do something wrong? You know, if you're a politician living in the trenches amidst 
dealing with wickedness is is hard. It's just hard. And and people don't want to get dirty, get their hands dirty. Yeah. So there were like a whole bunch of Christians who dismissed me because you're doing divorce work. Uh, and I like, oh, how could you be a Christian and do divorce work? Well, their pastors who dealt with the divorce messes, they loved me. <laughs> you know, they're like, you're honoring us and you're doing this a great service and you're not gouging people. And and uh I don't even know if I answered the question, can I? I hope I did. Well, did. Yeah. And the point I was trying to make in the question was that um, there it isn't necessarily inconsistent. The the key word here is necessarily. And I'm saying that not for you, but for all of our listeners who aren't listening yeah. carefully. But it isn't necessarily inconsistent to be in a role that is aggressive, competitive, uh, litigious, oppositional, uh, and yet to be a devout and sincere Christian. Now, it may fray your spirituality a bit. You already alluded to that. It's hard to you know stay in the presence. Um, so there are challenges to it. But I think one of the problems we have in the public square right now is that Christians have often abandoned exactly these kinds of roles, and they're no longer tough-minded. They're no longer resilient. They're no longer able to argue persuasively or to, you know, roll up their sleeves and yeah. I mean, really get into things. Um, and with that, um, what that means is that the only people who are in that kind of work are evil men and imposters who go from bad to worse, deceiving yeah. and being yeah. deceived. Who use the power and position to enrich themselves one way or the other, and, and whatever, whatever their vice is. It's the op it's the means to satisfy their addictions of choice. That's right. And I mean, this could apply in so many different ways. You mentioned, you know, maybe a colonel and you made a comment about they're like bullies for whom the only language they will understand is the language of force. You know, many people, this is near and dear to my heart right now. Uh, many people are wringing their hands over Israel being at war with Hamas. Hamas doesn't understand any other language than force. And if Hamas would lay down their weapons and uh, abandon their platform of abolishing, destroying the state of Israel, there could be peace in the Middle East tomorrow. But it doesn't work that way in the real world sometimes. And so what I what I like about the things you're saying, Ed, is that on the one hand, you've shown us the heart of God flowing through you and, you know, your pastoral care and your affection for the people you oversee and, you know, you, the value you place on Molly and how she compliments you and maybe carries out some functions in the church that that you wouldn't do as well. So on the one hand, you've got all that. And on the other hand, you're in this um, this profession that I think reputationally lawyers are, you know, often viewed askance. Um, I think it was William Shakespeare who even said in one of his plays, first we kill all the lawyers. So I think you know, Lennon, I think Lennon quoted that too. So you want to hear a good lawyer thing? Yeah. I, I gotta tell you a lawyer thing. So my son is in like, I think fourth grade, maybe fifth grade. He's a really smart kid. It was my oldest. He said, dad, I learned a new word today. And I'm like, yeah, you did. And he said, you're a pastor and a lawyer, right? He says, yeah. So that makes you an oxymoron. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so he's like, I'm like, like only a fourth grader, or fifth, you know, a, an overachieving, brilliant fourth grader can say, dad, you're, I'm like, ah, oh, that was good, son. You can't call me a moron, though. <laughs> <laughs> like, how can you be a pastor, Christian, lawyer, and and I, I really think my the the skills aren't weren't that different. They really I mean, weren't. Are, uh, Charles Finney, the famous revivalist, he was a lawyer. Yeah. You know, he said that his skill in handling the law gave him skill in handling the Word of God, because if nothing else, he learned to read it closely and carefully and to extract the meaning of the text not based on hearsay or what everybody wanted it to say but based on what it actually said yeah yeah, yeah. so anyway i i just i appreciate that so much about you and whenever i'm with you i always i just relish those times because um i love that side of you uh that competitive side and yet that compassionate side i love the fact that you're very bright and you know you have an inquiring mind and you know, you've continued to fuel that and to grow uh, through the years. You're just, anyway, you're a remarkable individual. 
Well, thanks, Ken. I got another one for you. I'm preaching. I'm talking about sin. I said, there was no sin. You know, it, it, without sin, there'd be no doctors and there'd be no lawyers. I'm like, were there any lawyers in the garden? And then somebody in the congregation was, there was one in the tree. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I just lost. And I started laughing. I'm like, you interrupted me. You shouldn't do that. But that was really good. <laughs> you know, like the serpent. It's like, yeah, there was a lawyer in the garden. It was the serpent in the tree. <laughs> and so, oh, that was that was fun. But the truth, would, would we need lawyers? Except that I have an advocate before the father. That's I true. Think, I think I have an advocate. I got a lawyer. I got the best lawyer in the universe. Yeah. And he's before the father right now. Yeah. So I can support these lawyer things. I can go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, I want to ask you about something else, though, because I made the comment in the introduction that you okay. are, you know, viewed by those who know you also uh, as a prophet. Now, you you alluded to maybe some things that many would consider prophetic even early in your life, um, you know, how you how you moved out of being a conventional Catholic into a truly devout man. But in your own mind, when did your prophetic gifting switch on and how did that happen? And what do you do to nurture that now? Well, I have to, um, we started going, I was in a Catholic charismatic prayer group and I'd seen some stuff and the Lord started giving me phrases and sentences during the worship time. And I began to pray, say them out loud. So that was prophetic. I I be I was challenged when I got filled with the Holy Spirit to pray in tongues an hour a day. I began doing that. I began seeing and having revelation and stuff happen. For me, tongues is the most important of the spiritual gifts because it. I think it was the doorway into all the other gifts that God wanted to use in me. It was God praying for me. So I, I think that was the most important. But then from the dreams and... I think there was a prophetic edge to me even before I didn't know I had a prophetic edge. Uh, I, I don't, I, you know, it's hard to say, Ken, but I do know this, that we had a prophetic group back in the late eighties or, or early nineties. And we began having a discipling of the prophetic. And I was invited to that group. And so was Molly, you know, John Paul Jackson was there. We had other people, come in there was bob jones was there at one point and so i had there were these very famous people at the time who were there who came and would teach and we were pastored in it and we were pastored by somebody i think the best pastor were was a counselor and her husband were the pastors and they pastored this group there were other gifted people but they really were they just pastored us and and i think that's where it came. My first prophecy conference was in 1989 in, in central in, in central Illinois. I was invited to a prophecy conference. I think it was probably like uh, September of 1989. I was invited to do a prophetic training. And I might have been teaching your materials on prophecy. Did you put the <laughs> did you put the material, the little prophecy book together? Was that yours? That one I didn't put together, but okay. we, I used it. <laughs> and repurposed it and expanded on it for later conferences on prophecy. But the original one I didn't do. Yeah. And so I remember going to Australia and New Zealand in 89 or in February. I went to uh, 1990. I think I was in Edinburgh with Paul Kane, Wayne Grudem, his book on the gift of prophecy. I'm like, I, I told him on the plane, I'm like, you're a frustrated lawyer. I'm like, this book is so, he's like, I almost wanted to be a lawyer. I almost went to law school. <laughs> and, I think the thing that really broke it is in, in Scotland, I I had four of the six words of knowledge that John Wimber gave that night. And um, and I'm like, what are you doing, God? What are you doing? And that's when I really felt he was calling me into ministry. And I don't I don't know a time that I didn't have prophetic. I don't I can't remember a time really since I got filled with the Holy Spirit, I guess I, I would say this, the summer after I got filled, so the summer of 87, somebody had words of knowledge that the pictures I was seeing were words of knowledge for somebody else. And I'm like, and Ed, you're seeing this and you're seeing that. And I'm like, you mean that's prophetic? I didn't even know. And we were watching Wimber healing tapes on VHS as a group together. <laughs> that was a long time ago. That's a long time ago. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, you mean all those pictures and things that I see are 
that's God? Because I'm seeing them all the time, you know? And I'm like, oh. And then I got into the discipleship group at the at the at the Vineyard Church I was at. And and uh, I can't be grateful enough for the opportunity to go out and make messes. And I didn't want to make messes, but to go after it. So yeah. I don't know. I don't know, Ken. I'll just say this for our listeners. I mean, I've ministered alongside of you on multiple occasions in the time we've known each other. In fact, I remember, I think it was the first time I met you, I was leading a meeting and someone had told you to come over. And so you were kind of standing on the side and uh, you asked for permission to pray for somebody. And I said, sure, go ahead. I didn't really know you, but I knew your name because someone had told me about you. And, uh, you know, people started falling over and shaking and i think someone got delivered of an evil spirit and um anyway so i thought okay yeah this guy's one of us and then uh, <laughs> but i've seen you function um calling people out of crowds i've seen you use the gift diagnostically uh when you're praying for people just one to one um i've seen multiple dimensions of this and um it's just it again it it breaks the paradigm that's why i wanted you on the show because you are a paradigm breaking individual that someone who has the kind of mind that you have and who's been the kind of uh, litigator, um, you know, divorce attorney, whatever, all these different roles that you've been in can also not just be evangelistic or pastoral, you also function prophetically. And there's no inconsistency here. The main barriers are in our own heads yeah. that say you can't do all of this at once. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I had someone... I was in a uh, mentoring thing probably 15 years ago and a, a woman insightful, she's prophetic too. She's like, how do you live within you? Cause I see this really deep thinker and this really crazy prophetic guy. How does, I'm like, there's a tension. Yeah, I agree with you. How do I live in the tension? And I, I think for me, I've just tried to say, Lord, you sit on the throne, Holy spirit, sit on the throne of my mind, my emotions, my spirit, whatever I'm going to do. And, and I, I, I think, I think I just try to say, try to submit, tell me what you want me to do and command me to do it. That's my prayer. Holy spirit, soul of my soul, I adore thee, enlighten, guide, strengthen, and console me. Tell me what you want me to do and command me to do. Yeah. That served me well. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know. I can't even put the words, the internal crazyometer that goes off i'm like oh ed you know and i still have this western lawyer educated rational scientific method i i think that way I, I i had science digest magazines growing up i loved this stuff i was sort of an i was gonna say nerd ken i don't know if i want to say nerd but i guess you maybe i'm a recovering nerd I, I don't know if you are yet but you're like i'm like i love to think but then how do i walk that out in an anti-spiritual anti-supernatural world and I've just found asking questions and saying, I know this thing sounds a little weird. You know, this really, I'm having this thought. It seems really weird. And I don't know if it makes any sense, but sometimes God speaks to me. I'm still learning, you know, boom. And and I, I've i taught prophecy, first prophecy class in 1989. And I've been doing it for a long time. I get away with, not get away. You have access to people's hearts by asking questions and getting permission far more than you could ever be is like the Lord says this, even if you're spot on yeah. building a relational an honor bridge, respect bridge, love bridge is far more important. But I, I yeah, I, I wonder the same thing about you, Ken, you know, I, I remember you said, well, that's absolute zero at our church. And I'm like, how many knows what Calvin degrees are? I'm like, I know what Calvin Calvin degrees are. Ken knows what it is. I'm like, there's three people who might know what Calvin is an absolute zero. And I'm like, I'm like, Ken, you are such a nerd. And I'm like, and I'm like but then I said, well, if I understand him, what's that make me? <laughs> so, <laughs> that's that's real. But I laugh at it. I, I've learned to laugh at it. Yeah, if you can't laugh at yourself, I'm like, I'm stretched beyond anything I could wrap my brain over. God, you've made me this way. Hey, Lord, I just want to obey. Help me to just obey. Yeah, that's a good word. All right. Well, I also made mention at the start of our show, and we've run a bit long here, but um, um, you've been raised from the dead. And I don't think I've had anybody on the show yet who's been raised from the dead. Um, so uh, I've heard you tell this uh, series of stories uh, several times, but 
I thought it would be fun for our listeners because we often quote the line, heal the sick, raise the dead. Um, so th- th- we could also talk about raising the dead, but but you have been raised. So um, you're not only Ed Lochran, you're Ed Lazarus. And why don't you tell us what that was all about? Well, I was 49. I was feeling weary. And um, I said, I'm going to take a four week sabbatical. That would have been my first sabbatical. I only got eight days. I died on the eighth day and um, of the sabbatical. Uh, I did have one this year, first time, <laughs> three months after 35 years of doing this. And, um, and I went on a bike ride. I'm going, I was walking, I was praying, but I was just feeling exhausted when I would work out. And I, didn't know my blood pressure was pretty fine. I just, this is May, but I'd been to the doctor in December and everything was fine. So it wasn't like I'm the guy who didn't pay attention. So I'm out on a bike path. I'm going 15 miles one way and coming back at about 10 and a half, 11 miles. God's I'm, I'm praying in the spirit while I'm going. I always pray in the spirit, whatever I do. If I'm alone, I I do that walking or, or biking and and the voice came, turn your bike around now. I immediately hit the brakes, like hit on my on my new bike. <laughs> and, um, and I turned it around and uh, I started coming back. I got to the base. The bike was in a, a valley. The bike path was in a valley. He got said, walk it up the hill. I walked it up the hill, came home, sat down, and I just felt exhausted. I'm like, I just felt tired. And and usually I'd work out, I'd feel good. And so I finally got up off the couch. I sat there for maybe two minutes and I'm like, I'm not going to let this hold me down. I went up, took a shower. And as I get out of the shower, I I felt achy all over. I didn't feel pain. I felt worse pain on a lot of different things. And I said to my wife, Molly, she just came home from the store. And I said, Molly, come up here. I need you. And she came upstairs and I said, I don't know. I'm feeling achy all, all over. There might be something wrong. And she said, well, if I'm calling an ambulance, I'm not going to let them see our bedroom. And we had four kids still at home at the time. It's like, there are six baskets of unfolded laundry in this bedroom, and they can't look at that. I'm like, yes, dear. But I'm like, I marched down from the upstairs to the main level, and I came to the my front room, and I felt like I stood there, and I just felt, I need to sit down. I need to sit down. I just, and I just, I didn't know it, and I... I died right there. I just dropped to the floor and I was immediately next to Jesus. And so ask me anything from there. The thing is, if I didn't know the voice of God, I would have died seven miles out on a bike path. If I had died at the same time with no one around and no one there to help me. And so I dropped dead And Molly's first statement. was like, wow, doesn't take long to die. But she had been talking about covenant and says, God, I'm the weaker vessel. I'm the weaker party in this. Um, and so, Lord, you, I need you here. And she's like, there's no way he's going out like this. I rebuke you, death, in the name of Jesus. She started going off, praying like a crazy thing. And I, I think whatever, what's kind of strange, I don't tell people this that much, but whatever thing that was on me, that whatever the uh, kind of Elisha, Elijah, Elisha, Elijah, Elisha thing, she suddenly picked in, kicked into this butt kicking, ferocious person. I'm dead. And she starts going after it. And um, and so she's rebuking death. Uh, I I wake up. Um, I wake up after her prayers. I then actually am in the ambulance. She's behind praying in the ambulance when they they came to get me. And I sat up and started talking to, to people in the ambulance. And they're like, we've never had anybody have a massive heart attack and die and start talking to us. And so my front left coronary artery was um, completely blocked. You're not supposed to live through that. So that's what happened. What they call the widow maker. The widow maker. It is the widow maker. And um, <clears throat> so I'm immediately in heaven. So I don't have much time because when I was dead, I felt like I had... 12 to 18 hours in heaven, if I had to say all the things that we went through. So I usually kind of give a shorter period of time. Um, so I, I, I want to just defer to you on this podcast here for how much time you want or ask me questions. Well, Paul said that when he was caught up to the third heaven, he heard certain things that a man is not permitted to utter. So 
don't utter what you shouldn't, but tell us a few things about heaven. What did you see? What did you experience? What did you learn? Well, the first thing is, is I felt like if I could take my fingers, like maybe an eighth of an inch apart and hold it at a distance as far out as I could, my arm will go. I could see there were people there. I could not recognize any people, but I was standing right next to Jesus. He was a little taller than me. And I knew not to look at his face. And, and I, I felt his affection again, the affection of God. I talked about that earlier, just the affection of Jesus. I, um, he, I, I, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. And I said, how can that be? How can that be, Lord? I, I feel like I've done this much. You've called me to this much. I still had hands that worked in heaven. I don't know. <laughs> it was like I had arms. But I felt like I've only accomplished this much with my life. And he said, have you connected well with me? And I said, oh, Lord, I don't know anybody personally who prays and connects as much in time. I don't know anybody. I heard about this guy who prays eight hours a day. And uh, I, I, I was kind of weird. I'm having a conversation with him. But I said, I don't know anybody personally. And I said, I can, I've connected pretty well. So here's what I've accomplished. I've connected like three times much. And he came up and he matched me. He says, what you've done has come from this. Well done, good and faithful servant. He said it again to me. And it showed me that success had far not, you know, the worldly definition of success is off. There are measurables there, and I'm not against measurables. But the greater, the richer thing was that what I did, whatever it was, big or small, came from relationship with God. And that was what was the most powerful thing. That was one of the first things to redefine success for me. And um, so that that would be the first thing. The second thing was, I'll give you three. I, I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit, too. I didn't see Holy Spirit. But I was enveloped with the with the affection of God, and I felt the jealousy, one attribute. And this is where the old terms of ecstatic experiences would come into play, where I am surrounded by the presence of God. And, and, and it was timeless that the jealousy of God for me was so overwhelming, I could have just stayed in this one attribute of God forever. It was ecstatic beyond anything I could know or experience. And it really came away with it. Holy Spirit felt very feminine at first. And at the same time, then after the jealousy, it turned into this ferocity. Like, I don't want you to settle for anything less than all I've called you to. I am here to back up. There are purpose on your life. 99, don't settle for 99.99999% of what I've called you to. And there's this ferocity. Like, I want to kick butt on anything that stands in your way. And that was pretty transformative that we make, we've kind of, as we've allowed ourselves to be domesticated, I think we've tried to domesticate our God, who is not domesticated. And then I found myself at another point with the father. And I had a great dad. I've already talked about that. But it was as if Father God came down, he started singing my name. He, he sang and the affection and he danced around me. And he's like, my Eddie is like, it was like my Eddie, my Eddie, and he danced around me the way he would dance over Jesus. Mm. But the love, I, I don't know how else to say it. It's like as if I was Jesus. I wasn't Jesus. But like the affection, just the the depths of what salvation means to be adopted, to be his children, the firstborn among many brothers, that we're in Christ. I, I, I could go all kinds of theology on that, but it still is kind of mind-boggling and... um it almost feels like heretical. I'm not saying it's heretical, but the intensity of how he, the affection of the father over me was um, beyond beyond words. So that would be the quick, when I was dead, three big points from the Jesus, Holy Spirit and Father. Those are pretty, those are pretty powerful on their own. <laughs> um, I mean, it would be great to, hear more and more i don't know maybe we'll have you back just to tell stories from the other side sometime but uh let me ask you this question because sometimes people have this did, did were you told by any of the three members of the trinity were you told anything maybe about what is to come or things of the future or upcoming difficulties or breakthroughs anything like that well this was 2012 and i guess i I saw an anarchy coming upon, and it was an anarchy in 2012. 
I saw it coming anarchy. It's almost like why share now because it is anarchy. I saw people rioting. I saw people greedy. They want what you have. They're going to take what you have. I, it was a lawlessness was being released, a wickedness and lawlessness upon this land and this culture. And and I saw it. I, I never thought like the wickedness, like if if I could harm your wife or your daughters, I'm going to harm them. And, and for me, I never felt like over my dead body as much as that one. But those are one of the things I saw that it was a warning of uh, of an anarchy, an ar anarchy breaking out, a wicked, yeah. lawless anarchy. And I think it's in a lot of ways all over the world. There's a spirit of it. And so that would be probably the biggest thing. Um, but I, I did feel that there was a sense that the father wanted to release his affection on the earth i felt like the next revival would be one about affection from the father that uh, jesus and the holy spirit have affection too but but that the you know it's almost as if i'm like god what does that mean and i felt like the reformation was the was the re re uh, emphasizing jesus and salvation yeah. who jesus is i felt the you know azusa street pentecostal stuff was about re-emphasizing the holy spirit but I felt like this next thing move is going to be not at the expense of the first two, because it's just an addition. It's all going to be there. So like, you don't have to surrender Jesus with the Holy Spirit. You don't have to surrender Jesus and Holy Spirit with the Father uh, because they're infinitely relational. And God is infinite. I learned God is infinitely relational. Uh, but it's like that the next move would be one of, of the Father. There's a, a, I think the Father speaks to the anarchy. The Father calls to bring peace to our hearts in the face of chaos. And I think we're going to have to learn to live in that affection and as the comfort in times, as times are crazy. I don't want to sound pessimistic, but I, I, I think there's going to be great revival. I've heard all those things. So when I came back, I said, Jesus asked me, do you want to stay or do you want to go back? And I said, God, you promised me culture transforming revival. I started quoting time, time zone and I said, I want to go back because you promised me that and Chicago is going to be a key place where you do that. And I want to be in the middle of that. I said, my girls need me. My daughters were 13 and 17 at the time. And I'm like, they need me. They, I said, my boys would be okay because it was hard to go back. And it's like, it's when I talk about the story, there's a grief that comes to my heart where I miss the affection. I, I, uh, there's loss. I live in loss. To live as Christ, to die as gain is a true statement. And then the last thing I said is my wife needs me. So I'm like these. So I feel like in a lot of ways, I'm God had, I, I had a duty. My boy, I couldn't make a selfish choice to just stay in heaven. But I think a lot of people, why don't they get raised from the dead? I think they don't want to come back. I think Jesus gives them permission. I've seen like, say, let's say there's 20 people I've met as I've shared my testimony and the three out of four who saw his face, all of them were had to be commanded to go back. The ones who didn't see his face could say yes, but those who saw the face of God would not, they're like, he had to command them. Your mom needs you. You need this. Your brother's going to stay with me. I've heard all kinds of stories when I've shared my story and yeah, but I'm going to get to see the face of God someday. I still have that to look forward to, but the, you know, the thing that last theological thing is that the sinful nature. I didn't fight the affection of God. Mm. You say, oh, I don't fight the affection of God. Baloney. <laughs> we all fight it. So I'm like, I could pass a polygraph that God's good, but he was going after an area deeper in my soul, maybe five or six years after I died. And I'm like, God, why don't I trust you? And I realized there's some defaults that happened before I was even knowledgeable. Maybe it was in the sandbox someday where I'm like, you can't trust this, or that's too intimate, or what do you, God, God, that's too gooey. I don't, don't show any emotion or something like that. And, and I, God went after that stuff and I'm like, oh Lord, forgive me. So I just repent. Lord, forgive me when my heart doesn't line up with you. Lord, I give you access to that. But when I was in heaven, just imagine freely receiving everything you could freely receive. Yeah. Wow. Wow. You know, you said something in there. You didn't say it this way, but you said it. The work we do on earth is important. 
And you, you said it when, by talking about, you know, going back, Molly needed you, your daughters needed you, maybe your sons would have been okay. Although, I don't know, maybe not. I mean, boys need their dads too. It mm -hmm. maybe seems like they were doing all right. But, and you talked about people who've been sent back having seen the face of God and they have to be sent back. They have to be told you are going back. Yeah. I think sometimes we become weary and well-doing. Um, of course, mm -hmm. I'm in scripture when I say that, but yeah, and we think that what we do doesn't matter or that nobody cares or no one's noticing, but actually what, what we do in this life, these deeds done in the flesh, um, these works, whether they're of charity or justice or whatever they may be, um, they, they actually do matter and they are part of what gets weighed in the scales at some point. I, I talked about the redefining su uh, success yeah. and, and what was powerful to me is I think Paul's getting paid spiritual residual on the Bible. <laughs> I, I think that sometimes, Oh, I have this great big church and God bless great big churches. God bless you. But I felt that God was telling me, how do you invest in people and lives that can last and reach three to four generations? And that really redefined what I understood success to be. Because if you can transform a, a, a family for three and four generations of God, that's far better than just having people for a generation get excited about Jesus and then go nominal. You know, like yeah. how do you, there was something in there that I walked away with like, so we, we changed the name when I moved to another location, the Legacy Vineyard, because I think God wants, he defines success as a kingdom legacy, a spiritual legacy that will remain in a place for three and four generations. I think after that, it's on the people who follow me on whether they're faithful. But if I can influence somebody to touch that, for and it changes how I think of ministry and church and what's important. What happens if you're just living poor, paycheck to paycheck? How does that work? How do I teach you skills? My grandfather's law degree has reached four generations, and I'm having the fifth generation come of blessing. But because his hard work and his brothers that cared and served and sacrificed, and it made it, uh, he made a way for me to have opportunities, even though the signs outside would say, help one and no Irish, no Catholics, no N word. That was our local city back in the turn of the century and because there are too many Irish and Catholics coming around. And, and it's like, so I think my grandfather seeing those signs was helped him be uh, supportive of people of color. You know what I mean? You're like, because you were treated like garbage. But I look at overcoming that adversity. Wow. There's, there's generations that can be touched. Yeah. Wow. Amen. Wow. There's so much more we could talk about. We probably yeah. planned this. We've been going about an hour and a half. Yeah. Um, well, you're my friend. We could talk forever. So we probably should wrap it up, Ken, because we're just going to keep talking and having fun. That's right. Um, would you say a prayer for me, for our listeners, uh, for Grant, who couldn't be with us? Would you say a prayer and just kind of pray us out? You've given us so much to chew on, so much to think about. Um including just how real heaven is and how the things that are eternal really do matter. Yeah. Well, you, I'd be glad pray, to. Or would you pray for us as we go? Yeah. Well, would I bless all I can in his ministry and all the kingdom contenders. I just like where they're in the game. Though we may not have perfect theology, but they're in the game. I bless everyone going through the ringer in the battle. I pray specifically for anyone in a divorce where their hearts have been broken, they felt shame and guilt, that you would heal them and you would break the power of that and you'd bring them to a better place of freedom. Cleanse them, break the, any soul ties, break any garbage off of them, Lord. Help them to walk in your purposes. Let Break the power of the shame and the guilt of that. And Lord, let them be cleansed through the blood of Jesus. And Lord, I just pray too, now favor for all the people contending for the kingdom. Let your presence fall. I pray a fresh revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that the delight of the heart of the Father would be on every single person, that they would be met in their dreams and their visions and in their heart with the heart of God 
the affection of the Father dancing and singing their name over them. And I pray the jealousy of God would be released, that God is so jealous for you that what can stop us? If God is for us, who can be against us? Because Holy Spirit is for us. So Lord, let your favor come. Bring healing and cleansing over people. And I, I just pray right now against any uh, mindset, passive mindset in doubt, passive mindset in doubt of, of your goodness. Break the power of that. And Lord, we, we can't pick ourselves up by the bootstraps. We just say, forgive us. Where we've made you too small in our eyes, where our minds believe your hand is too short to rescue, to save us, and where we've trusted in our own strength. Come, Lord, release us to become the people you want us to be. And I pray you would multiply the things that Ken is doing, that they would touch the ends of the earth, and that we would see people set free and healed and restored in ways we'd never imagined in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, Ed, thanks for being on the show. Um, we'll have you back. Uh, we'll have we'll do an episode just on more stories from heaven. I think that's an interesting one. And we only talked about the times you died. We still have to hear about the other two. So I think we've got fertile ground for more conversation. But that's all for now. Well, thanks for having me. Always glad to talk to you. I miss you, my friend, and keep up the good work. All right. And for all of you out there, thank you for joining us for this episode of God is Not a Theory. We'll be back here next week at the same usual time with another fresh episode of all the things that God is doing and how we know he is not a theory. If you are interested in exploring courses with us at Orbis School of Ministry, click on the link in the description of this podcast or go to orbissm.com. You can also send any school-related inquiries to our registrar, Joe McKay, at joe at orbisministries.org. That's j-o at orbisministries.org.